Separation Nation, again coming to you with great content, excited about today's topic. Listen, just want to take a moment and remind you that if you have not subscribed, it moves us up in the ratings, people, and we need to be seen because we're pretty and we sound good and whatever other reason you may come up with or ascertain after listening to this. But listen, seriously, like, subscribe, share it on social media. We want you to share the hell out of it. I mean, just get on Facebook Share that we post from Agents Resource Group, you know, agentsresourcegroup.com. You can go to that website there, and there's also a player where you can share from the Separation Nation icon. And just listen, help us get the message out. We want this thing to grow in the ratings. We want it to bring value to more and more people. That's why we're doing it. We don't get paid to do this. We're trying to legitimately bring some value, help some people that may be struggling, may be disillusioned, may realize and have this yearning that there's more to life than just living to pay bills until you die. And we're going to try to help you figure out what separators can you begin to bring to your life and to activate to help you get where you want to go, where you need to go, and where you may be called to go, which brings me to today's topic and i'm gonna ask john tanner a question but is there such thing as a supreme calling in life well i guess my answer is i don't know if i say yes and no or maybe sometimes this is this is the danger in in that statement i'm called to this or i'm called to that well when you say you're called to something, does that mean it's a lifetime calling? Is it a seasonal calling? Um, or are you called to multiple things? And it, 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 let me put it to you this way. I was, I was reading about Richard Branson, reading his story, how he, I think the first company that he founded was Virgin Records. Okay. Had great, great success with Virgin Records. Some might would say he was called to that industry. Success and calling, I don't think, always go necessarily. It, just because you're successful in an area, I don't necessarily think that means you're actually called to just that area and that's all you could do. Or just because you're good at something does not mean you should focus 100% all of your time and effort into that. And 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 I believe that's something that we, we put on ourselves, even as children, and we, we force ourselves in life to to search for that one thing that we're good at, let that be our calling or let that be our major if you're in college. What's your major going to be? How many people are, are are doing something in a career that has absolutely nothing to do with what they went to school for? That's something I think we search for. What is my calling in life? What is my destiny? What is my purpose? You can you say it any of those ways. That I think that I think you can spend your entire life never finding that if you let that be an obstacle or on the flip side, I think you could spend your entire life finding that over and over and over again at whatever you put your hand at talking about Richard Branson. He founded Virgin records, but today he owns or controls over 400 companies with a net worth of over $4 billion. So for somebody like Richard Branson or somebody like me or somebody like you or, or whoever might be listening to this, to, to look at a particular uh, passion that you may have or something that you're kind of good at or something that you, you may, maybe a career that you're in, and to pigeonhole yourself into uh, one particular thing and to say, this is my calling in life. I'm going to put all of my effort and all of my energy into this one thing, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life pursuing this one thing with tunnel vision and not worry about anything else in life. Well, if Richard Branson had not have had a, had that mentality, he wouldn't own 400 companies with over $4 billion in net worth. Another name. If I, if I, if I say George Clooney, what do you think? Actor. You think movies, you think the, the show ER George Clooney has made a ton of money 
in acting. Some might say he's called to be an actor. Some might say because of all of these gifts and talents that he has, he should spend his entire life, his entire purpose, his entire all of his thoughts, all of his energy, all of his money, all of his resources into pursuing this acting career because that's what he's called at. Well, guess what? He just sold a tequila company for over $700 million, but he wouldn't allow himself to be pigeonholed by a particular calling or to stay in his lane because God has given us all gifts and talents. And for us to to pigeonhole ourselves or for us to, to, to cap ourselves into one particular stream or one particular venue. And the reason I'm, I, I'm getting a little spiritual here is because I know that some of our uh, spiritual or religious listeners will beat the hell out of me on this because they believe if you're called to ministry or called to this or called to that, then that's all you can do. And, and they make this some divine uh, spiritual thing. And it can be, I'm not saying that, but God has called us to many things, I believe. I believe God calls us two things. I believe he calls us through things. And what I mean by that is I believe there's certain things in life that we go through that make us able to do other things that we may not could have done 10 years ago. I got gifts and talents inside of me, and I've learned some things over the last 10 years that qualify me for new callings, for new jobs, for new things. So that's I, I don't know if that answered your question, but... I believe, and I'll give you an example. I think Billy Graham said this when they said, Billy Graham, it is, it's, um, it's evident that you were called to be a preacher. Can you tell me when God called you to be a preacher? And he said, I ain't sure he ever did, but I hope I don't have to apologize because I really enjoy it. Right. And that was his answer. So, I, you know, that's where I'm at. The, the analysis of paralysis and people spend, you know, especially – from the, the church world, which means you had, you know, some experience in earlier on in life, people was always obsessed running around with, am I in the will of God? What's mm. the perfect will of God for my life? You know, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I missing the will of God for my life? Am I hurting God's heart because I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing vocationally? Now, all this, and that sucks up so much energy, and it takes so much of your focus. You can't be productive when you're in your own head all the time, That's right. overanalyzing, worrying. And people just need, you know, we're not, we're not going to get all theological in this podcast, but people just need to relax and just need to take. And listen, it's the principle of use whatever's in your hand. I mean, whatever's in your hand at that moment that you can be effective with, okay? You may not have a power tool and a chainsaw to take down that tree right now, but if you got an axe, then baby, get to swinging. Whatever it is, whatever tool that you've got currently to be able to be prosperous, to accomplish, to make money, to do what you need to do to provide for your family, it don't, just because you're doing that thing and it's right there in front of you and you can take that axe and you can chop that tree right now, doesn't mean that that axe is going to always be the tool. It doesn't mean that that tree is going to always be the target. It's a matter of handling first things first and tackling what's in front of you and understand. I mean, you talk about Richard Branson. Yeah, uh, for what's 400 companies you said. Okay. Right. But how many? I know I've read articles, and I, you've done the study on this, and I hadn't. But I know I've read articles about the number of companies that he's had. That failed. Right. You look at Donald Trump, the numbers of companies he's had that succeeded, but look at the ones that's failed. You know, the, he come out with a wine and a champagne company, failed Bobby miserably. Company. He come yeah. out with a, he partnered with Robert Kiyosaki on a university type training deal that not only did it fail, people come back and sued him on. Okay. I mean, the, the issue is, is that failure is always necessary for success. If you're not failing, you're not doing enough. You have to get out. You have to take massive action. But the main thing is, is get out of your head. Overthinking is one of the most toxic, anti-productive things. And anybody I've ever sat with, it says, well, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this or wondering, worrying about whether I should be doing that or not, or I'm doing, going to do this thing over here. All those people, they never experience, they might be doing a lot. They might not, they might be busy, but busy is not productive because if you cannot monetize what you're doing, if it doesn't monetize, if it doesn't come out in the form of something that you can utilize to help your family, to help other people, 
currency. If it doesn't come out the other end of the pipe like that, was all that action even worth anything? What, I mean, what did it accomplish? If it doesn't produce fruit that you can utilize that provides prosperity in your life, is it any good? Well, and, and this is another thing that, that along these same lines people get hung up on is, you know, and we'll get spiritual for a minute, you know. Um, if we t- we want to talk about purpose and calling, if you have any biblical background, then then you've heard the 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 scripture before that we were created for God, not just by God. We were created for God. When when God looked at Adam, He said, "It's not good that man should be alone." So He created Adam a helper. And the Bible says a helpmate, you know, um, he created her because she could communicate with him and because they were alike and he knew it was not good for man to be alone. Well, God created Adam first, but God created Adam for himself. God created Eve for Adam, but God created Adam for himself because he wanted someone like him. So we were created for God's pleasure, not for God's necessarily to to get these all this stuff done for god but for his pleasure so if we're created for his pleasure then doesn't it make sense that he wants us to be happy at whatever we're doing whether it's whether whether your job's to pick up trash beside the road do it and be happy until maybe that's what you're called to for a certain amount of time before you get to go to that next step because i believe that life is all about getting to that next level and I believe there's times that whether you believe it or not, whether you feel like there's some big purpose or some big destiny or some big calling on it, I believe a lot of times we got to show ourselves um, grateful, not just grateful, but we got to show ourselves able in this first calling before we can get to that next calling, in this first job before we can get to that next job. How many people's come through one of our companies and said, I want to be like you, but they want it right then? They want to. They don't want to go through the steps that it takes because they feel like they've called. To, they're called to something so much bigger and so much more. Well, the only way you're going to be able to get to that calling that's so much bigger and so much more is if you become so much bigger, right. and so much more. And that comes in all of that. That you know, growing. And I'll give you a great example if we want to stay biblical for a little while. Look at King David. When we first meet King David in the book in the Bible, he's a shepherd boy. Okay. Well, he graduates from shepherd boy because what did people tell him? They said, who do you think you are when Goliath comes out and he says all these things against the uh, the the is- Israelites and then he says all these things against God? What did David say? Who is he to defy our God? And then all of those soldiers that looked at him, what did they say? Who do you think you are? You're just a little shepherd boy. Okay, that's your calling. If you want to get pigeonholed into a calling, then he's a shepherd boy. But the need was for a warrior. So the shepherd boy put down the staff and picked up the sling that he knew how to use, an instrument of war. And he went from one calling to another calling overnight because that's what was needed. But he showed himself able and approved as a shepherd. He stepped into the calling that was needed. The task in front of him was to defeat the giant. It wasn't some big biblical thing. It's just this needs to be done. Nobody else is going to do it. I'm going to do it. So he went from one calling to the next, just like that. What if he'd have looked at his life and said, God's called me to be a shepherd. I'm going to be the best shepherd I'm ever going to be, and there's nothing else I can do because this is what everybody tells me I'm called to. People have no right to tell you what you're called to. What's in front of you is going to tell you what you're called to. He went from that. We see him again, put down the sword, picked up a harp, picked up an instrument, a musical instrument, and became called to entertain the king. And the reason God put him there to entertain a king is before you can become a king, you got to entertain kings. And so he went from become, from entertaining a king eventually to becoming a king, but he went from the calling of a shepherd to the calling of a warrior to the calling of a musician to entertain kings. And then he went from, from entertaining kings to fighting kings to conquering kings to becoming a, kings and we, a, a king. And we look all through his life at all these different steps all these different stages and all these different callings, but always up. So here's my answer to the question. Are we called? We called up. That's yeah. what we called to. 
for the you can't skip the process as we talked about before on here and the process is where you prove whether you're worthy of the outcome in that process are you able to stay faithful are you able to reinvent yourself listen the re the reason david could function in so many different jobs tasks things that would present themselves in other words the reason he's able to lay down the staff being a shepherd and pick up a sling is because he's confident in his identity he knows who he was he he knows he's called but he understands that calling and career and this is where people mess up uh, you can have a calling and function in a different career. You can have a career that you function in daily and it not be your ultimate calling. The calling may be the big umbrella, but you may have to get down here and do something that's segmented, that's separate from what you're called to do. I mean, I, when I look at my life and, and everything builds on each other, you know, start off as a music, musician, think I'm going to be a musician the rest of my life, you know, mm-hmm. come back get involved in administration, in ministry, then get into entrepreneurial real estate, okay? Then from then from real estate, getting into the insurance business, which we are now, right. okay? The, my calling is not to sell insurance. My calling is to help people like we're doing here today, to be, do, and have more, to get the message out to the masses. I do... I do more pastoring and counseling and trying to help people and listening to problems and sort out chaos and drama in their life. And here's some practical steps, how to have a more peaceful home so that you can be clear headed and function better in the field to sell every day. I do more pastoring and counseling now than I ever did when I quote unquote wore the collar. Okay. And, 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 and had clerical service as my uh, vocational uh, title. And so you know, but when I look back, media, things that that we did back in the ministry days that I first got turned on to in the music field, in the music business industry, right. I took that, brought that to the ministry, did that for a number of years, get out of the ministry. Then I'm selling insurance. I'm in an in-between time. I'm doing what I have to do until I'm able to do again what I'm born to do, but doing that faithfully, getting out and selling policies every day in insurance and building wealth and building success began to attract people that that catapulted me into another place where people said, we need to hear more of what you got to say. We want to do what you're doing. And now we're, here we are. We're media again. We're doing media. We're buying equipment. We're creating a studio. We're got books coming out to spur and off of this. We've got, you know, no telling what all will come from it. But when I look back, all that's tied together, but the tasks have been different the whole time. But I've never been scared to whatever was in front of me to pick up that tool and use it in my hand and understand that it doesn't, my career don't always, and this is where some of you just need to unstrap yourself and get that weight and that bondage and people's opinion. Listen, stop letting blind people proofread your vision. Mm. You sitting here getting all this, letting all these people speak into your life and you get, you, I mean, one over here is throwing peas on, on your plate for your palate. And the other one's throwing turnip greens. And this one's throwing pizza. And this one's throwing, I mean, if you go down to Ryan's buffet line, and I don't eat buffets, I don't eat nowhere where there's no sneeze shield. But I'll tell you right now, if you work your way all the way down to buffet and you eat you eat the pizza bar and the, you know, the crab legs and the turnip, if you eat everything on the line, you're going to get constipated. And a lot of you is living your whole life constipated. You never, nothing, nothing can move through you. No, nothing can, can, I mean, you just living your life sick. You just feel disgusted with yourself. I mean, like I felt after Thanksgiving meal the other day. I mean, you just, you, you're all just clamped up and you're not able to function and move freely and do what you need to do. Cause you letting all these people, speak into your life. And what I want to do is tell you, listen, tell them to line their resumes up 
What have they accomplished? Why are you letting blind people proofread your vision? You need a handful at the most of proven relationships, people that have actually accomplished something, done something, got something to show for it, to speak into your life. And just understand it's okay to use what's in your hand. It's okay to be able to reinvent yourself in that moment for what you need, which is what all successful people are able to do. They don't get hung up. They don't major on the minors and get hung up on the small things. I'm not playing. The, the reason I'm anywhere I'm at today and and, we're, and got a long way to go is because I wasn't playing the music industry game. I wasn't playing the church game. I wasn't playing the real estate game or the assisted living homes that I own game. I, I, what I've been playing is the life game. And whatever I had to do to get where I need to be in life is what I picked up and used to get there. And that's the way I'm going to continue to do it. Well, and it's like the saying we talked about many times, and I've said many times, you got to follow the green, not necessarily follow the dream. Because, um, both of us started out as musicians, you know, I grew up playing instruments. That's kind of how our relationship evolved, playing in bands and different things together. And, you know, I'm, I may pick up a guitar and go sing out somewhere and people come up to, why ain't you doing this for a living? Well, there ain't no money in it. Unless right. you're going to be the next Garth Brooks or Tim McGraw, there's no money in it. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm 40, almost 43 years old. I'm not going to have a career in Nashville. It, right. It's over. Don't mean I don't enjoy it. Don't mean God didn't call me to be a musician. That's something I can do. I play in church. I play for fun. Sometimes go out and entertain. I enjoy doing it. I sit down, pick my guitar up at home, play music. My kids come in, join in with me. I enjoy it. And is there some bit of a calling on me to do that? I don't know. I'll say this. Music calls me to it from time to time. But so does business. And one thing that that people would do, and, and it don't make them bad because they don't mean to, but they put guilt on you. Because I said, that's what you were called to be. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Like you said, they, that, that's not their decision. But what we can't do is let that guilt drive us and cause us to be confused. Because at the end of the day, and I'm going to say this, and there's going to be a lot of listeners that's going to disagree with me. But I don't think God is as concerned with what we do as he is how we're doing. Right. He's not as concerned with what we're doing as he is how we're doing. God wants us to be good. And I don't mean good from a work standpoint, but I th- he just wants everything with us to be good, our health to be good, our, our emotions, our energy to be good. Yes, we're called according to his purposes, if you want to get scriptural and spiritual. Yes, we are. But his purpose, I think, ultimately, is for us to have a well-being about us and not to be loaded down with guilt. Two th- things Vocation and location cause people more frustration than anything. Wanting to always get the location right, always wanting to get the vocation right. Don't you think God's big enough that if we screw up on either one of them, he can get us to where we want to be? Yeah. It's kind of like the GPS thing. If I dial in that I want to go to a particular address in Atlanta, Georgia, and I make a wrong turn just because I couldn't get to my exit, what's that GPS going to do? It's going to recalculate and recalibrate and show me an alternative route or tell me to turn around. And God's big enough to do that. And and here's the thing. You know, it's like you said, all the gifts and calling, all the things that I learned to do with my first job, my second job, my third, I'm on like my fifth different vocation on my tenth different location. But, you know, um, at the end of the day, I'm still doing the things that I don't always like. You know, this this career that I'm in, and, and there's there's multiple facets to it, we talk all the time. There's certain things we love about it, certain things we hate about it. We manage the things we don't like and the things we have to, to deal with. But what we do love is the outcome and the results, and that don't always equate to money. Look at the relationships you're building out there. Look at the people you're helping. We still want to help people. That's the ultimate right. the, the ultimate desire for this podcast and the companies that we own are to help people and to, to train people, to help people to grow and help people to accomplish the things that we've accomplished in life. And so um, not to let the guilt of, well, you should have been doing this or you should have been doing that, let the results speak for themselves. And we're not saying, and, and y'all hear us well on this, and don't take us where we're not going with things. But we're not saying geography in life doesn't matter. It's not important. Where you live does matter. 
you know, uh, it's the fact of the matter. There's a reason that you see Walgreens and Rite Aid only on corners. <laughs> okay. Right. You know what I mean? There's strategic plans behind things. But what we are saying is, is don't sit here and bite your nails down to the bloody quick, you know, because you're overanalyzing and worried about every little old move. If you mess up, if you make a mistake, if failure is not final or fatal, you're not a tree. If you not don't like where you're at or you realize you made a mistake, get up and move yourself. If you don't like, I mean, life's like a TV. You don't like the channel, it's on, pick up the remote and change it. I mean, take action, change what you're doing. And here's what, here's what you got to understand. We've said this before. Everything that happens, happens for you. It does not happen to you. Mm. And I, I put up a, a, a motivational picture meme thing. We had them do put on social media here several weeks ago. I had some people like make some confused emoji faces on it. And I had some folks send me, you know, questions about it. Well, what do you mean by that? I don't understand. That don't sound right. But those people sending that to me, when I began to talk to them, basically bottom line is they had a victim mentality. They have the mentality that, well, this happened to me and this set me back. And so now I can't move forward. And like you talking about Branson, 400 companies, all this. Here's the thing. When he hit a wall, he just went and started another company. He found the next thing to get into. What 97% of America does when they hit a wall, they go sit in a corner, cry, suck their thumb, gather all the family around and cry. Say, oh, this didn't work out. Everybody pet me. This didn't work out. Well, things just happens for Joe Blow over there, but it never works out for me. Everything that... You know, Tom, Dick, and Harry over here touch turns to gold, but it just didn't meant for me. I don't know. Poor pitiful me. I'm just going to go back to the factory. I'm going to go back to being a cashier, or I'm just going to go back and pick back up what I had before and do whatever it is that I know how to do I, just to survive. And and that's where people begin to c- become complacent and say, well, if I can just, you know, money's not the most important thing. It's happiness, you know. And that's so stupid. I mean, they that's broke like, people. It's hard to be happy when you broke. It's hard to be happy. But that's like saying, okay, well, you people say, well, what about money's not the most important thing? What about love? What about family? Well, well, listen, Sandra, I mean, what's more important, your leg or your arm? How about they both important? How about you need them both? They both, yeah, we not, we're not saying love's not important. We're not, like I said earlier, we're not saying geography's not important. But you can, you can correct things in life and still survive and still move on. Failure is part of the process. No, you can't plant a banana tree in Alaska and it live and thrive. But thank God you're not a tree, so you can get up and walk out of Alaska and move back to the sunny beaches of Florida and plant you behind there where you can grow and flourish and do something. Sometimes we go in life, we run after what we think we want, realizing that we can't be productive there, but you can correct. It's not final. It's not fatal. The only way it's fatal is if you stay in that climate and give up that you're not supposed to be in to begin with. And so, I mean, just the big thing here is, is just understand and this is freeing. I hope for a lot of you that's listening to this, because this is one of the number one things we deal with with people. But, if you mess up, just keep going. Go a different route. Find a different way. As long as you're moving forward on the path, what you need in life will always come to you as it's needed. And there's paths I've been on. I didn't know necessarily the music path was going to lead me to ministry. I didn't know the ministry path was going to lead me into entrepreneurship and real estate. I didn't know that that, that was going to crash and, and lead yeah. me into into insurance. And I, I sure as heck, I'm shocked I'm sitting here today doing a podcast. I didn't know that the insurance business would lead us to being able to have really at this point and begin to develop a global reach to help people. It's a different kind of ministry now, but it's still helping people and still being able to reach out. And and it's just everything works in life to serve you if you allow it to serve you, which is why the statement I made, everything happens for you and not to you. Yeah, things may happen to you, but if you begin to grow as a person and develop the mindset to perceive, okay, that may have happened to me, but now reverse, I'm fixing to process it as it happened for me. Now let me stop. What can I learn from that? What did that teach me about myself? What did it teach me about people? What did it teach me about the vocation? What can I gain from that experience? Because if you're looking for something to gain, 
from it, as bad as it may have been, there will always be something. But if you're not looking for it and you're interpreting it from a victim mentality of this happened to me and now I'm a victim and now there's nothing I can do about it, you'll spend your life being a victim, having your butt kicked day in and day out. Yeah, and and I think another big thing too with this because we talk about you know guilt. Um, you hear people say you missed your calling, and you know we miss a lot in life. We miss the mark on a lot of things. We make a lot of mistakes. You and I sat down. We just had a, a a small thing that we were trying to do and accomplish that kind of blew up on us with some some different types of leads and stuff. And um, and you can look at it and you can get frustrated. Well, I lost a little money there. Well, no, we didn't lose a little money. We invested a little money to learn a little something that's going to help us to make a lot of money one day. And that doesn't mean we missed a mark or missed God. You know, you, you hear that statement, he must have missed God or I must have missed God. If God is so big and he's the biggest thing that there is, he's, he's all-powerful, all-present, He's all of these things. How can you miss him? You can't miss God. You can mess up. But God ain't like a little bullseye on a pin that you're trying to hit. It ain't like that. It's like that big book back in the day, God Chasers. He's hiding from you. you got to find him. That's the biggest bunch of bull in the earth. God ain't hiding from nobody. God's screaming from the mountaintops, come to me. He ain't hiding from us. And I get the connotation and, the, and all of this, always you know, be a God chaser and all that. But at the end of the day, we got to quit getting hung up on, are we making a mistake? The worst thing to do, I'd rather go backwards and mess up than stand still. Yeah, I would rather take the wrong job than take no job. Like you said, be uh, paralysis by analysis. And some people are so afraid of messing up that they don't take that next next step. And, um, and another thing's comparing. You know, a lot of people... If you have a particular vocation or a particular job, you got two choices. Do it with the very best of your ability and enjoy it or compare yourself to other people that's in different positions or whatever. And there's certain people that no matter what they do in life, what vocation or location you put them in, they're going to be happy. Then you got certain people that no matter what vocation or location you put them in, they're not going to be happy. Comparison is the greatest thief of joy. Absolutely. It'll suck your joy out. And it's a decision to make. There's a story I heard a long time ago, and I, I'll probably tell it wrong, but there was this couple, and they had two babies, identical twins. They watched these two boys as they grew up, and they realized, realized that one of these boys was an extreme optimist. He never saw anything negative in anything, always positive, always looking for the silver lining. They also had, in the other son, the opposite of that, an extreme pessimist. Everything he touched, he complained about. Everything he saw, he found something negative about. Every opportunity in front of him, he looked at as another way to fail. And the parents were, they were, um, they were concerned for both of them. They were concerned that one of them was too optimistic that he was going to get taken advantage of in life, that he was going to mess around and get in trouble because he trusted everybody. He saw good in everybody. He saw good in everything. And, and so it concerned them. But at the same time, the pessimistic son that never found happiness in anything always looked for the, the, the bad in everything. They were equally concerned in both of them. So the parents went to a therapist and they laid it out for the therapist. And they said, they said that, we're concerned for both of these children. They're the opposites of each other. And the optimism is good, but it's it's almost too much. The pessimism, I, we like that he's concerned and that he, he uh, avoids certain dangerous things, but we're very concerned. So the therapist said, we'll solve this with one exercise. You may not like it, but this is what I want you to do. Do they have the same room or separate rooms? Said they got separate rooms. Okay, on the one that's an extreme optimist i want you to go to the store and buy all the gifts that you can afford all of the things that he's ever wanted and i want you to wrap them up and when he comes i want you to put them all in his room the one that's pessimistic uh or excuse me the one that's optimistic i want you to put in his room something negative something that will bring him down to earth so for the one that is 
pessimistic. We're going to bless him in such a way that he finds some way to look at it in a positive light. But the one that's such an optimist, this is what I want you to do. Go get horse manure and fill his room with crap to the point that we bring him down to reality. So they go and they do both of these things and they go home and the, the pessimistic kid gets off the school bus, walks in the door, throws his bag down, head down at the dumps, and storms up to his room like he always does. They looked at each other and smiled because they knew he was fixing to be blessed by all of these gifts all over this room. The optimistic kid come in right behind him, skipping and singing and laughing like he always does, and they just smiled at him and said, we're going to bring him down to reality. He goes up to his room. About 15 minutes later, they go up and they go to the one that's always negative. They open his door and he's laying on the floor crying. He says, son, what's wrong with you? You got all these gifts, all these good things all around you. Why are you crying? He said, how long do I have to live? He said, what are you talking about? I said, why would you give me all of these gifts unless I'm about to die? Why would you do all of these things that, that you've done unless there's something wrong? They just scratch their head and they turn around and they shut the door and they say, I don't know what we're going to do with him. So they go to the next room that's just filled with all this horse manure everywhere and they look and they can't find the sun. And they finally see this brown ball going across back and forth all through the room like he's looking for something. They, they yelled his name. He turned around. He opened. All you can see is his eyes because he's covered in manure. They said, son, what in the world are you doing? They said, well, if all this horse manure in here, they got to be a pony somewhere, daddy. I'm going <laughs> to find it. I mean, and, and, and that's the thing. That's a silly story. But at the end of the day, we got to whatever we, whether we feel like we're called to it or not, Whatever we got in our hand, whether it's a pen, whether it's a, a, a trowel to lay bricks with, whether it's a hammer to nail shingles on a roof, we got to find contentment. And when I say contentment, that does not mean we need to settle there. We got to have an attitude of gratitude. I know that sounds corny, but our state determines our fate, and we determine our state, not circumstances and things around us, but we determine that. And we got to do it with the best of our ability, happy and grateful even if we don't think that's necessarily what we're called to do, because God's big enough to get us to that next step.